Um, and then uh, if you wanna just keep your mic muted while others are talking, uh, you can use the chat function to ask questions or the raise hand function during the Q&A and we will get to everybody's questions hopefully. So thank you so much. I'll pass it over to Chanel now. Uh, thanks so much, Kim. Oh, so today we have the oh, we have the pleasure of hosting Professor Isabel Hofmeyer, who will have a talk titled Dockside Reading, Hydrocolonialism and the Custom House. And I now have the privilege of introducing Professor Hofmeyer to you. Isabel Hofmeyer is Professor Emeritus at the University of Witwatersrand, Rand, Johannesburg, and Global Distinguished Professor at NYU. She has worked extensively on the Indian Ocean world and oceanic themes more generally. She co-directs a project, Oceanic Humanities for the Global South, from Mozambique, with partners from Mozambique, India, Jamaica, and Barbados. Thank you so much for being with us today, Professor Hofmeyer. The floor is yours. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Chanel. So firstly, thanks very much to Professor McCorney for the invitation to be here, to Chanel van Amerifa for all of her help, and also to Joey Verfail for her assistance. Um, and thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, so I'm just really going to give you a sense of what this book is about. And at this time, just read a, a very short extract. Okay, so let me begin then with the background to the book. And the project really took shape some years back in the wake of my previous book, Gandhi's Printing Press Experiments in Slow Reading, which explored Gandhi's newspaper and printing endeavors during his South African sojourn, which was 1893 to 1914. One minor theme in the book was Gandhi's steadfast opposition to copyright, which he regarded as a form of private property. Having completed the book, I wanted to investigate this thread further. Was Gandhi's position unusual or not? What was the situation with regard to colonial copyright? Rather surprisingly, the search led me to the dockside and the custom house, since as I discovered, it was this department that had overseen copyright. Printed matter coming from outside the colony had to be funneled through the port city where customs officials checked to see that it was not pirated, seditious or obscene. Customs hence became the part of the colonial state that oversaw both copyright and censorship. So I sought out the customs archive in South Africa with some trepidation, expecting dry and tedious reports on taxation and tariffs. Instead, I found a fascinating archive teeming with objects, in some cases, actual ones like swatches of fabric, labels of tinned condensed milk and packets of seeds. The documents themselves were filled with arguments about what these items actually were. Was a substance butter or margarine? Was there a difference between tea and medicinal herbs? Was a young pilchard the same thing as a sardine? The custom house was far more in intriguing than I had in anticipated. Now, had I done this project 10 or 15 years ago, I would no doubt have, dr have written a drier book focusing only on the print culture implications of copyright and censorship in the custom house without considering its coastal location. While Gandhi's printing press had situated itself in the field of Indian Ocean studies, uh, like much scholarship on the maritime world, there was not much actual sea involved. Instead, the ocean features as, as a backdrop for human movement, uh, more surface uh, than volumetric depth. Over the last decade, rising sea levels and climate catastrophe have impacted powerfully on oceanic studies itself, which now grapples with how to go below the waterline and engage with the materialities and ecologies of the marine world. So doc dockside reading is an attempt to embed print culture in this new oceanic studies to put water and paper closer together. The book tracks printed manner printed matter from ship to shore and through the regulatory regimes of the custom house. The setting is late 19th and early 20th century Southern Africa with glimpses towards other parts of the British Empire. The study traces how customs dockside protocols shaped understandings of copyright and censorship. So rather than an institution associated with the rights of the author, copyright became conflated 
with cargo and commodity markings, especially a thing called mark of origin, you know, made in England, made in Australia, and so forth. British copyright became a token that a book had been made in the metropole and was implicitly white uh, and safe to admit. Colonial copyright was hence construed as a logistical inscription and a racial trademark. As regards censorship, material was not read so much as treated like other forms of cargo, scanned for markings, and sampled for traces of, of offensive material. Tax collectors at heart, customs officials were not keen readers. Instead, when dealing with a suspicious book, they applied the same techniques they did to other suspect cargoes that they sampled, they counted, measured, and touched. Rather than reading them, they assayed books as objects. Books were hence routinely judged by their covers, their language or script, French or suspect, non-Roman script positively dangerous. Inspectors focus on outward metadata like title, copyright or publisher rather than content. Like other suspect cargo, objectionable book, book, books became potential vectors of contamination. And so the reading methods of the custom house were to, and, you know, these reading methods were to feed into subsequent apartheid censorship practices, which in part drew on the methods uh, used by the custom, by customs inspectors. The literary consequences of the custom house eddied outward, not only across the dockside, but at times onto and under the water. Customs inspectors dumped unclaimed, smuggled or banned items into the ocean, as did passengers approaching those ports where pirated reprints of copyrighted works were not permitted and the books were then thrown overboard. The two terms, as you can see in the title, dockside reading and hydrocolonialism, and these constitute the larger frameworks for contextualizing these reading and hermeneutic protocols. The first term provides a micro view of the dockside procedures in relation to cargo and how these were transferred to books. The second term furnishes a larger framework for theorizing these types of shore shaped literary formations. So let me just expand briefly on both of these. So I'll discuss dockside reading under four headings, that is objects, bodies, books, and reading. So the section on objects uh, really broadly argues that ports are shaped by the objects that pass through them. So cargo determines work routines, the architecture and the architecture of ports. So, you know, liquid um, required gauging, tea had to be sniffed and so forth and so on. Heavy substances like iron and building stone had to be examined on the wharf, lighter, lighter more portable material in warehouses, meat required refrigerated storage, timber demanded cranes and so on and so on. So the section on bodies argues that these, that these practices around objects were transferred to bodies. Policies of fumigation, disinfection, and quarantine were first applied to objects and then to people. On Ellis Island, immigrants were tagged, chalked, and marked as if they were cargo. Indentured Chinese laborers uh, were routinely referred to as bonded merchandise. The transfer of this cultural orientation onto human bodies is clearest, obviously, in the case of the Atlantic slave trade, where people were branded like wine barrels and crammed into holds. Across the Atlantic world, customs officials were intimately involved with receiving and processing enslaved peoples uh, who were regarded as dutiable commodities. The section on books explores how customs officials classified and read books. So books were generally classified as a subspecies of paper, or in the words of the Indian tariff, they were regarded under this classification of paper and its applications. So books formed part of a paper world, you know, that was imported, made, made up of things like pro forma documents, like receipt folios, membership certificates, letterheads, labels, and where books do feature, they generally resemble forms like an account book, a birthday book, a Boy Scout register, a cricket school book. So when books were suspicious in some way, customs officials had to read them. 
Unsurprisingly, they treated these publications as a form of miniature cargo, their outer coverings perused, perused for logical inscriptions, their inside subject to the same protocols of measuring, sampling, and counting deployed on other troublesome consignments. Um, so, as I've said, you know, they assayed books rather than read them. So these modes of reading produce definitions of what the colonial book might or should be. And one of these was the book as form, okay, in which you have the situation that you have a template from the metropolis, like a membership certificate, a letterhead, or a cricket scorebook, which was then filled with local scribblings, um, quite literally a case of form over content. Many colonial novels followed a similar pattern with a generic blueprint from the imperial center boilerplated with provincial contact, co content. So the book as form also featured in settler and immigrant handbooks, which included the forms to be completed on arrival. So these fusion of handbook and forms helped to land immigrants, guiding them through disembarkation formalities. So these volumes also acted in concert with port infrastructure and its land reclamation, which literally reached out to incoming passengers of the right class and race, giving them their first purchase on the colony. We might think of these settler you know, handbooks with their forms as a mode of textual land reclamation or landfill, extending literary infrastructure outward to enable the immigrant to become landed and that term landed had two meanings, you know, physically to be placed on the dock, but also to be legally and permanently admitted, as in the phrase landed immigrant. So these genres of the dock side, um, then also one of the things I do is to argue that they can be inserted into debates on Southern African literature. And I argue that we can see them as standing between two key colonial genres, the story of the shipwreck on the one hand and the farm novel on the other. Just as, as port cities were intended to overcome the problem of shipwreck and to offer safe landings uh, to settlers of the right race and class, so the book as form assisted in this process, offering you know, settlers traction on the colony itself. The instit institution through which many settlers achieved this aim was the farm, and as James Kutsia has famously argued, the farm novel became a key intellectual instrument of land possession and dispossession. And so just the, the section on reading then considers the customs reading practices in relation um, to current post-humanist object-orient ideas of books and reading. So I compare customs readings to digital literary criticism, where reading by metadata and algorithm is routine. Customs officials did not have reverence for the book as a humanist object that would change consciousness. Um, it was simply more cargo. A, a, a kind of a form of uncooperative stationery. Uh, the methods, uh, this method, uh, these methods of half reading accord with a lot of current book history, if you, if you follow that sort of scholarship, which is very interested in this world of not reading, non-reading or semi-reading, you know, which is how most of us read because it's quite unusual, in fact, to read an entire book. Okay, just very briefly, the term hydro-colonialism is, you know, used as a conceptual framework. It's a neologism. It riffs off the term post-colonialism. And like, like that concept has a wide potential remit, could include colonization by way of water, you know, various forms of maritime imperialism, colonization of water, occupation of land with water resources, declaration of territorial waters, the militarization and geopoliticization of oceans, a colony on or in water, the ship is a mini miniature colony, the penal, penal island, um, colonization through water, flooding of occupied land, and colonization of the idea of water itself. So the way in which the water gets turned into a secular resource. So modeling itself on post-colonial theory with its cultural remit, hydrocolonialism traces the configuration of literary institutions across land and sea, empire and environment. It explores the literary implications opened up by overlaying the hydrological cycle onto imperial and post-imperial cartographies. And it argues that this move requires us to think laterally, vertically, and contrapuntally between different water worlds and hydro imaginaries. Okay. 
So um, there are, of course, also an exciting number of water-linked literary and cultural approaches like critical ocean studies, wet ontologies, immersive methodologies, blue humanities, hydrocritical uh, approaches, atmospheric um, and elemental approaches, and so on. Um, and I, you know, uh, situate my work, my work in that particular field and seek to sort of add to it. Um, the particular areas that I focus on, I think, are colonized, what I call colonized water and creolized water. So let me just explain briefly those two ideas. So the section on colonized water examines how coastal waters come to be colonized. So one method was a kind of aquatic territorialism by which land or landforms are extended into the sea, either literally through reclamation and submarine infrastructure, or by the extension of land-based methods of governance over the ocean, you know, promulgations of, several, of sovereignty, port regulations pertaining to the intertidal zone, declarations of quarantine, quarantine stage stations around um, areas of ships. Uh, the book also looks very briefly at port engineering, a central narrative of colonial uh, possession, and a founding mythology of many colonial port cities themselves. The harbor engineer becomes a minor sort of imperial figure, a, 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 you know, a, a tireless soldier who takes on the Sisyphean battle against sand. So I think the submarine imperialism is only starting to find a conceptual vocabulary. Ben Mendelssohn's work on Lagos offers an instructive, an instructive example, which demonstrates how, quote, sand and related coastal geomorphological processes interact with the city's political and imaginative trajectories, as well as its historical le legacies. Okay, so creolized water, um, you know, just briefly, um, you know, actually in most parts of the world, if you're looking at bodies of water, you looking at a kind of popular archive of many different kinds of understandings of, of water. So while true, as I say, for any body of water, such creolization would be especially pertinent in imperial and post-imperial settings. Southern African waters, for example, are especially creolized, being the imagined domain of African ancestors, Khoisan or roughly First Nation water spirits and deities, Muslim water gyms, associated with enslaved communities brought under the Dutch to the Cape, as well as imperial also ideals of the sea as the site of a kind of maritime manliness. The concept of creolized water can be usefully put in conversation with black hydro poetics and thinking around the middle passage. Ancestral and aquafuturist, to use Susanna Chan's term, um, there is now of course an extensive body of creative and scholarly explorations with you know, thinking about uh, the Atlantic undersea as a realm of speculative uh, diasporic histories. Um, putting this black hydropoetics in relation to Southern Africa, South, Southern African creolized water opens up like suggestive submarine cartographies. So these might map how Southern African oceanic ancestral traditions relate to the drowned communities of both the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean, the, re the arena from which Cape sla um, uh, slaves were drawn. Once one considers this enlarged realm, the dramatis personae expand, you know, taking in the jinns and genies of the Indian Ocean, the ancestors of the African Oceans, the submerged deities of Indian indentured communities, and the drowned uh, of both the Middle Passage and the Indian Ocean. Okay, how are we doing for time? Um, okay, I thought there's a, uh, I've got a chapter breakdown, but I think you've got enough of a sense of the, what it's about. And so just to give, to show you that customs can be very riveting, let me just read you the opening paragraphs of the book. So in the early 1950s, the South African Customs and Excise Department issued a list of prohibited and restricted imports and exports. At first glance, the items listed are predictable, protected flora and fauna, historical relics, poisons, pests, perishable, dangerous chemicals, drugs, adulterated food, all those items that needed to be kept in or out to ensure the safety, security, and identity of the white nation and its citizens. Yet tucked into the list are some surprises. On the sea list, lurking among cacti, carcasses, crocodiles, Curios and cuttlefish, we encounter copyright. 
on the tea list, ticks, toads, tomatoes, tortoises, and toy pistols leads us to trademark, positioned just above treacle. Other surprises are books placed amongst bodies, in brackets dead, bones and boots, printed matter surrounded by prickly pears, primates, projectiles and prunes, and sensors located perhaps appropriately between cement and centipedes. These T's and C's did not mean that copyright, trademark and censors were prohibited. Quite the opposite, in fact, since customs and excise used these mechanisms to exploit, to exclude material de de deemed undesirable or counterfeit. In the colonial context, much printed matter came from outside the colony and was funneled through the port, where customs inspectors checked to see that it was not pirated, seditious, obscene, or in some regions, blasphemous. In the realm of customs and excise, copyright and censorship hence cohabit with a band of troublesome, troublesome objects that putrefy, perish, catalyze, deceive, poison, and adulterate. No longer just an abstract legal form, copyright subsists alongside the ooze and treacle of organic matter. Censorship likewise acquires strange bedfellows, cement, crocodiles, and centipedes. Considered from the viewpoint of customs and excise, copyright and censorship appear almost visceral, a quality seldom associated with intellectual property mechanisms generally imagined as noiseless and odorless. We think of copyright as a quiet and dry institution moving through registry offices with a barely audible rustle of paper. In a similar vein, censorship is generally imagined as silently sinister with anonymous bureaucrats burrowing away in Soviet style buildings. Yet in the colonial port, copyright policy and censorship protocols took shape in the clamor of the waterfront and its imbroglio of incoming cargo. These commodities might be diseased, contaminated, undesirable, illegal, or counterfeit. The hold of a vessel hummed with microbes, weevily maize, rotting cargo, dogs, parrots, reptiles, and cattle, both dead and alive. Ships burped bilge water, extruded diseased human bodies, deposited animal carcasses, secreted seditious pamphlets and obscene objects, and disgorged, quote unquote, undesirable aliens. Dockside reading locates itself in this noisome location, tracking printed matter as it's made its way from ship, ship to shore and through the regulatory regimes of the Custom House. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Isabel Hofmeyer. Uh, this was a very thought-provoking uh, introduction to your uh, book. Uh, and uh, I will invite now uh, Makone to initiate the conversation. I, I want to engage in a conversation with, with you, Isabel. But I want to start off um, at a very broad level, a very general level. What exactly is this project called Oceanic Humanities for the Global South? What exactly are you trying to conceptually accomplish in that project? And we can move on to more specific discussion. Okay, okay, thanks very much. So I think on the most simple level, it's an attempt to take the strengths of humanities in things like literature and art and think about how you can use that to engage more fully with the materiality of the ocean. Okay. So because as I said, there's an old, the old school sort of oceanic approaches were very much, um, you know, the, the, the ocean was simply this backdrop or surface for human movement. Um, so there was no, there was no actual, there was no seeness, you know, it was simply a, a sort of background, it was a canvas across which various human actors moved, okay. So, and then with the, um, you know, uh, the Anthropocene, uh, climate catastrophe, um, uh, the, one of the most pressing issues in, you know, one of the most visible signs often of climate catastrophe is rising sea levels. 
question. So the sea is really sort of forcing itself upon us or you know, demanding our attention. And so what, um, and the Oceanic Humanities, the, the project of Oceanic Humanities is to say we can't simply respond or think about the ocean in this old way in which it's really focusing on humans. It's not engaging with the materiality of the ocean. It's a multi-species world, all of those sorts of things. Um, you know, and but particularly the oceanic humanities then for the global south mm -hmm. is then to say if you those approaches then also have to factor in the questions of the global south, you know, histories of colonialism and inequality. Um, the way in which climate change is obviously going to impact um, parts of the ex-third world in, in you know, much more often harsher sorts of ways. So it's a, an attempt then, as I said, to take traditional humanities approaches, think about uh, this new sort of material approach to the ocean, but while hanging on to broader post-colonial, decolonial themes because of um, one's location or one's interest in the global south. Okay, so, um, okay, let me follow this then. What then is the relationship between the, con the concepts of hydro-colonialism and settler colonialism or extractive colonialism? What sort of relationship do you see developing between these? Because you have introduced another way of characterizing colonialism, hydrocolonialism. But then the question for me then becomes: once you do that, how do how does that relate to other types of colonialisms that we've been talking about so far? I mean, like settler colonialism, extractive colonialism. Hey. Hey. Thanks very much. That's, an absolutely, that's a sort of key, key question. I think <laughs> the one point that people that that, that you know the, the general point I think that could one would make is that ideas of settler colonialism or extractive colonialism tend to be hugely focused on land. Uh -huh. and I think that is a project that is a, a sort of byproduct both of settler ideologies mm -hmm. um, where you have settlers then trying to sort of erase their origins from over the ocean. So the ocean itself gets erased as they lay stronger claim to the land. And it's also then in a way sort of overlaps with anti-colonial nationalism where, you know, anti-colonial nationalists also tend to turn their back on the ocean because it's the source of imperialism, okay? And so then the discourses, obviously, you know, discourses about land then become central, both to settler ideologies and to anti-colonial nationalism, okay? So then everybody's, so, so, you know, partly again, under the influence of the Anthropocene, you know, the growth of e uh, ecological envi and environmental approaches, elemental approaches, atmospheric approaches, or however you want to characterize them, you know, is to say, okay, we need then to think about in something not only land as a medium. What about water? Okay. Yeah. Partly also because water is so central to dispossession. So it's not simply land that is dispossessed, it is land with water resources on it, which tends to be the first you know, kind of land that is targeted. Um, and you can see it, the, the point has been made, if you look at, um, in South Africa, uh, farm names, always, in many, many of them have a water, you know, something pun or strum or something, you know, um, indicating that, that the farm as a mechanism of dispossession has been organized around water. Um, so I think if I can just also say, it seems to me, if you extend this, this, you know, if you think about the ecological approaches generally, it seems to me what we encourage to do is to not, is to become aware of how horizontal our thought is, you know, because, yeah. we, you know, we think about the, the land, a sort of, you think about, 
you know, that the land is a sort of automatic platform of knowledge and that we are on a you know, sort of Cartesian orientation towards it. Um, um, and I think sorts of approaches then say we've got to think much more volumetrically or vertically. You know, so that you've, you've, you know, you've got to think about um, the, you've got to think about the elements. You've got to think about air. You've got to think mm. about water, both in the sky and and you know, um, water underground. Um, yeah. So yeah. So those that, that's sort of how I would frame it. So that's what you meant by saying that some of the contemporary approaches to colonialism. In, in, in some of these approaches, land is overdetermined and water is erased. Okay, now let me follow this up then. As I was rereading re your chapter one, the concept that I couldn't pin down clearly was the notion of creolized water. Let me explain why I was a bit confused here is that the notion of creolization appears quite frequently in political science, for example. It appears also quite frequently in, in sociolinguistics. So when you were talking about creolized water, I was then wondering, are there any instances of uncreolized water? First of all, what do you mean by creolized water? And what is the opposite? of creolized water. Okay, thanks, thanks. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much. Um, I, I went for that term because in, uh, one of the things is to, um, um, <coughs> sorry, let me just rewind. I, I went for that term um, because I think that you, you're trying to also think, get readers or students who yes. are <clears throat> to think about water as an incredibly complex and animated site okay because because we we have all been trained to think about water as sort of simply a secular resource you tend to think of it as empty mm -hmm. um, so i used i thought the idea of creolization would be useful because then it it starts to get people to think about how crowded water bodies actually are with mm -hmm. all of these hydro imaginaries. So if I can just give you, I think, one really good example of creolization in water, in the, in water is I learned this from one of our graduate students, Mapura and Mohulatsi. Um, uh, uh, in apparently in most South African townships, the, in, if there are bodies of water, the, and especially to keep kids away from them or if they've been drownings, people will say, you mustn't go there. The Vater Macy lives there. Okay, so the water woman or water spirit, you know, the water sprite lives there. And I think that's a really fascinating interaction between Khoisan implications where there's a very strong idea of water, you know, uh, sort of water maidens, if you like, I suppose, would be one way of translating it. Um, interacting then with, say, African ideas of um, certain types of water bodies, you know, with, uh, that are animated or living water as the realm of the ancestors. So I think, you know, you start to get all of these really interesting um, sort of interactions. And, and I think also, although, I mean, I haven't really tracked this in detail, you can also, it, it also overlaid at times might be the idea of the jinn, you know, the uh, Muslim idea of the jinn. So I'm sort of interested in those interactions um, and, um, you know, which I suppose would loosely be a form of creativity. It may not be, you know, the sort of much stricter definitions that I know linguists use. Um, okay. Um, Raphael, I can stop here. I've had a, a conversation with Christine Severo from Brazil, where she's talking about how notions about water look like 
from the Brazilian perspective. Christine, do you want to jump in? Oh, hello, everyone. Actually, I was not prepared for jumping in. <laughs> <laughs> OK, OK. I, but I, yes, we were just discussing also the political side of this yeah. aspect. Maybe mm -hmm. we could, uh, if uh, Professor Isabel could say something about this political side of the discussion, if you think, for example, from the perspective of the Atlantic, the Black Atlantic, mm -hmm. Avery, and uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you, thank you. If I could just say, I mean, yeah, there are very rich ways that you could come at that. I'll, I'll get onto the Black Atlantic, but I think I mean, there's also huge amounts of work on water and citizenship. You know, so political struggles around water, um, which will become increasingly obviously important. Um, you know, and there's a lot of really interesting work. Uh, I'm uh, sort of more aware of the Southern African stuff, looking at how, um, Popular struggles, uh, you know, often shape, 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 shape around uh, the commoditization or the fights against the commoditization of water. Okay, um, obviously the other big thing is it was is the struggles uh, against dam building um, mm -hmm. and dam as the great sort of hydro infrastructure of uh, post-colonial states. Um, and obviously, there's been lots of really, lot, lot really, 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 really interesting work. Um, just, just on the Black Atlantic, I mean, there's really huge amounts of fascinating work, which I'm sure, you know, you must know about on, um, you know, uh, I don't know if you know the artist Ellen Gallagher. Much of her early work is really interested in thinking about, um, of, you know, obviously the afterlives of drowned communities of enslaved peoples. Yes, yes. And it, she's got a really interesting way of doing this because I think one of the issues, if you're trying to think about how to go below the waterline, is you've got to deal with questions of scale and visibility, okay? Because, you know, we can't see it under there. We can't, you know, the scale is so enormous. There's a constant motion. There's no fixed point. You know, so all of our Cartesian certainties are completely... Um, you know, uh, you know, kind of lost. Um, and she does amazing work. Um, I don't know if, if you know, she, her work's really amazing, but, but one of the things she does is she has, um, she embeds tiny human faces often in marine plant life. Um, and so it really is, again, thinking about a multi-species world, about the sort of scale of which we think, um, you know, so you've got to look really, really hard to see um, you know, these, uh, these sort of human-like features. Um, obviously, I'm sure many of you must be aware of the uh, music of Drexia and the whole idea of Drexia as this, um, you know, imagined underwater realm where it's imagined that somehow um, the children of pregnant enslaved people who were thrown overboard to have managed to live underwater and so there, there's a whole Drexian subcultures, you know, music and play, you know, novels and comics and all sorts of things. Um, I'm just trying to think of the um, uh, lots of, you know, so, so just huge amounts of, and I mean, obviously the big one is 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 also all of all of the work around mummy water, um, this kind of pan, you know, pan Atlantic figure. Um, you know, again, this sort of woman, uh, sort of water god type, um, uh, you know, uh, formation. So, you know, it's just, it's a hugely interesting area to think about the Black Atlantic under the waterline. Um, and, and, you know, just as I say, I'm sure you, you're all aware of, um, you know, the very rich kinds of cultural formations that have taken shape around that. Thank you, Marconi and Christina for initiating uh, the discussion. Uh, like I wrote in the chat, if uh, anybody else would like to ask a question or make a comment, please let me know and uh, I'll organize the Q&A. And uh, while I still give people more time, I will uh, jump in and ask a question uh, myself. 
which uh, I've been actually uh, struggling to formulate because uh, my colleagues are much more well-versed in uh, wet ontologists and epistemologists uh, centered around the notion of water than me. But I am uh, intrigued by the notion of um, colonized water. And uh, the question that I've been trying to formulate here, I even uh, tried to write it down to see if it's uh, clearer, clearer when I present it. Uh, do you see potential in the concept of colonized water to help us think about the decolonial? Uh, that is, uh, centering the notion of colonialism or coloniality around water from an oceanic humanities perspective helps us to expand our, our understanding of coloniality beyond the domination of people and land, if I understood. Uh, uh, kind of superficially your, uh, your concept. Uh, so do you see potential of this epistemological gesture in joining forces with uh, decolonial efforts or what would a project aiming at decolonizing uh, colonized water look like epistemologically? Great, thank you. Thank you, that's a great question. Um, I, I think absolutely. I think um, there is, uh, Again, if, if I'm going to sort of speak from a Southern African context, um, because the, the, the ocean was for so long seen as the sort of the, the, the space from which imperialism came, there was, as I say, an, a lot of anti-colonial nationalism consciously, you know, was very much invested in a discourse of the land and was really not interested um, in water. It, the, the, it's again just to talk about the political aspects. I mean, in there's also a whole politics, obviously, of beaches, um, and you know, under apartheid, beaches were racially segregated. Um, it, you know, uh, the, the, and there's a whole, obviously, a whole politics of swimming that goes on, um, you know, in all sorts of, uh, you know, in, in in and it's a, you know, it's a it's a kind of issue that's um, very present in South Africa. Um, so I think the the the, the this turn to think about firstly about water as colonized I think is important because I think one tends to think about the elements as being uncolonizable because they cannot be settled. So you know people often think you can you know you don't think about the air as being colonized or um, the atmosphere is being colonized or water is being colonized. Um, you know, you think you call it, something has to be settled in order for it to be colonized. So I think firstly, it extends then the idea of what colonization is and helps us to think about how elements, you know, and particularly ice, for example, um, the, 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 the whole sort of Antarctic, you know, and the Arctic and the Antarctic become then a way of this performance of a kind of white masculinity. Um, uh, and so that's colonized in particular sorts of ways. I just think um, it also, the in again, uh, thinking from a Southern African perspective, but I think this is true for all various parts of the world, is that the sea is really, uh, the, both the ocean, but also large water bodies are really powerful, kind of sources of popular memory. So I think that kind of, you know, rituals and ideas often associated with water have kind of existed in an under the radar way. Um, and they've been in in enabled by, by bodies of water. So I think they are really, really interesting popular archives, um, which again can be explored and, um, Sort of mobilized under under a sort of decolonial project, um, um, and of, again, of course, they're, they're very interesting uh, ways also of thinking about this. You often get. Uh, I was reading something on um, the sort of Indonesian archipelagos where you'll get um, the very local coastline is often considered to have sort of local deities, but once you're out on the open water. It's much more associated with the monotheistic gods. So again, I think it's a very interesting way of thinking about particularly the coast then as a form of, uh, as a sort of very rich decolonial site. Thank you very much. 
Uh, I see that uh, Nikolai has uh, raised the hand. So please, Nikolai. Yeah, uh, I'm. I'm sorry. Uh, this is a question that's uh, very similar to the to, to the previous one. Uh, 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 you very much had my my ideas in mind. So. Um, I'm I'm interested uh, uh, mostly in uh, oceanic literatures in, in East Asia, but these questions are occupying uh, are occupying me. So uh, I thank you very much for your talk. It has has uh, given a lot of uh, food for thought. So I'm asking the the uh, probably obvious uh, question: Is there something like a hydro anti-colonialism? Um, so there there is work uh, that focuses on water-based uh, epistemologies that can be read in uh, decolonial ways, as you just suggested, going back all the way to uh, Ipili Hawofa, um, and more recently, Karin uh, Arimoto uh, Ingersoll's Waves of Knowing, whose work I found extremely stimulating and useful for myself. But your work seems to point us uh, towards alternative strategies beyond the epistemological by emphasizing, for example, materiality. Um, so again, uh, do you see an opening for uh, something like a hydro decolonialism or an uh, hydro anti-colonialism? Okay, um, great, thanks, thanks. That's a really, really interesting point. Um, I think that probably there are two ways to think about it. I mean, the one is to, there's a huge amount of social and labor history on dock workers, sailors, um, and the, the kinds of forms of solidarity and interaction between them. So I think, you know, that, and, and that often is quite a good vector for sort of the spread of, you know, anti-colonial uh, or anti-imperial ideologies. Um, you know, so there's a lot of stuff on sailors, then smuggling Garveyite pamphlets into Australia, you know, that sort of thing. So that, that I think could be one route. The other route I think is to look at this whole realm of speculative fiction, science fiction, Afrofuturism, um, and what, as I quoted, Susanna Chan has this term aquafuturism. So I think there, there's a very conscious turn to use the undersea as a, a, a kind of consciously decolonial space. Um, and so there it's, um, it's, you know, it's interested in sort of multi-species, um, uh, sort of anti-extractive ideologies, all of those sorts of things. Um, so I think, yeah, those would be, I think, ways to think about, uh, yeah, to, 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 to think about sort of, I suppose, anti-colonial or decolonial um, forms. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have two more questions. Uh, one is from Ashraf, who uh, wrote to me, and then another one from uh, Chanel. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Ashraf's question. And uh, the question is, can you, uh, yes, can you please ask Isabel uh, about the cultural politics of the Renaissance Dam in Africa, the conflict over Ethiopian Dam, and how this dam is used as a site to do politics? Um, oh, uh, I know very little about the Renaissance Dam. I mean, I, I, I'm just aware that it's a, you know, a source of, of, of great contention, but I really, I can't help you on the Renaissance, on the Renaissance project. Um, I'm just trying to see, is the question here? Uh, well, he wrote to me privately, uh, so oh, the okay. question is, yeah, <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't help you on that one. But then the next one uh, is from uh, Chanel, who writes, uh, in your research, uh, what is the role of women or gender thinking about water and African spirituality? You spoke about the uh, water macy, pardon my pronunciation, and there is also the rain queen in the Limpopo province. Uh, thanks. That's a, you know, that's a really, that's a great, again, a, 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 another great question. There are, I mean, there's a whole... Um, there is, um, you know, this idea very often that water spirits are gendered in some way. Um, although I think the ways in which they're gendered are really interesting. And again, possibly sort of extend, you know, sort of fairly narrow or binary ideas of, of, of sort of landed gender, if you like. Um, I think uh, 
there is, so there's been quite a, you know, there's quite a lot of work now on hydro feminism. Um, and so part of that project would be a claiming of those sorts of figures. Um, there's a lot of obviously feminist work on uh, related to water. Um, somebody was mentioning the ways of knowing earlier. Um, I can't remember, somebody was talking about it. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of work uh, thinking about um, uh, trans uh, transcorporeality, you know, so thinking about how we, we are both water, but all bodies are linked in various sorts of ways. Um, and yeah, so there's a whole, you know, if, if, if you're interested in that, there, there, there's a lot of sort of very interesting work happening around um, uh, so, yeah, sort of the and, and, and under this rubric of hydro feminism. Um, yeah, let me leave that there. Thank you. And next, we have a comment by Michael Scott, who writes uh, Nemoil circles to the force page turner on the Zambezi and past future colonialities provides a vivid, visceral immersion in creolization of water the old drift. It is extremely rich as a text in social linguistics in addition. Reading it got me through a rough period of lockdown in the water-stressed Persian Gulf last spring. Would you like to add anything, uh, Michael? Or? Well, thanks for the invitation, but no, I mean, I was just struck <laughs> by it, by how vividly this presentation brought back memory of, of this incredible book. Um, I, I really do recommend it. Uh, also, uh, at the same period, I did first come across the whole realm of Drexia. So it's also very nice to hear that, again, referenced in, in, this, in the uh, presentation now. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. That's a wonderful question. Um, it's a fantastic, it's, it's, it's a really great novel. Um, and as you say, it's, it's, it's a really good case of the creolization of water around the Kariba Dam. Um, so partly that it's a sort of multi-generational novel. And also really interestingly, has a, 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 a engineer who's a central figure um, in, in the story. So I think you know, that's also the figure of the engineer, I think, and sort of these hydro infrastructures are really interesting. Um, and just so basically, I mean, for those of you who don't know the novel, one of the things about Kariba is there was um, a lot of displacement, sort of forced removal of people. And there was a belief that the, the sort of water god, Yummy Yummy, um, was really sort of, you know, kind of very angry with all of this and so disrupted the building of the dam considerably. Um, and so that also features in the, um, in the thing. I think the really fascinating thing also, the book is hugely about mosquitoes. And so it's a really interesting sort of, um, you know, and, and mosquitoes obviously it, it, coming out of these little puddles of water, there's, um, it, you know, there's a lot of raining going on in the novel. Um, and so it's also about, I think, these sort of long, much longer time scales, you know, the, the mosquito time scale versus the human time scale. So that's really interesting. But just on that, if you, um, myself and two colleagues, Sean Lavery and Sarah Nuttall, have just um, done a special issue of interventions called Reading for Water. Um, the articles are all out and we're just waiting for a sort of slot, you know, in the lineup and then our introduction will be included. And Sarah Nuttall has a fabulous piece, which is in fact out on, on the novel. Um, she's very interested. She's developed this idea of pluviality, you know, thinking about rain and how one factors in rain um, into she, uh, you know, she's a literary scholar, so she's interested in questions of sort of rain and literary, and literary form. Great, thank you so much. 
now Cristina Severo joins us again with uh, another question uh, about the political aspect of hydrocolonialism. And uh, Cristina asks, how can we include the discussion on environmental racism into the debate on water-based epistemologies? Okay, great. Thanks. That's a really, again, another you know, absolutely central question. Um, and I think the... Uh, the, again, sort of various routes that you could take into it, and I would take a sort of Southern African, take a Southern African route into that. And I think the thing, the one of the aspects of environmental racism is the pro various projects in South Africa, and particularly in Zimbabwe, of dam building. So in, apparently, um, Rhodesian settlers uh, built dams on a quite extraordinary, you know, the, the, the number of dams they've been built was quite remarkable. And partly, of course, what they were trying to do was reproduce a kind of British idea of the landscape, where you can only have a, a, an appreciation of the landscape if there is a, a sort of large reflective surface of water. Um, so I think that's one way then of tracing those sorts of histories I suppose in the way also then in which water is, there's a kind of hydro imaginary there in which water is implicitly racialized. Um, and it's seen then as the setting of this kind of, you know, the sort of British settler tradition um, and so forth and so on. So I think that would be one way to, to, to think about that. I think also there is, um, if, if you're interested in this, there's a fabulous uh, um, South African poet called, uh, I'll just write it up, a uh, performance poet uh, called Kodeka Patuma. And she's got a performance poem called Water. Um, if you're interested in it, you can read it. And so what, she, what that poem does is it looks at this whole sort of politics of the beach and swimming. And it's you know it's set, set it's on a beach, and so she contrasts, and she looks at the the sort of racialized ideas of the beach and of swimming, um, and she also then contrasts this idea of the idea of the beach as a space of leisure and consumerism, while for a lot of people other you know. Uh, uh, African communities, it's a space, it's a spiritual space of cleansing and baptism and healing. And it's also obviously the space of drowned slave communities. Um, and she contrasts and plays with those two sorts of different kinds of water epistemologies. So I think if you're interested in it, it's, it's, it's quite a short piece, but um, is really quite illuminating on, on this question. Thank you. And now we have uh, one more. Uh, actually, it's a set of questions, uh, two questions uh, by Sangeet Bhagagupta, uh, who uh, writes first, uh, thanks for this intriguing talk. Two questions. The first to Isabel. What about landlocked waterways like rivers, lakes, etc.? Is there a space for such hybrid water landscapes in your thinking? And then uh, she poses a question to uh, everyone. Playing on the popularity of linguistic landscapes in the language sciences, is there emerging linguistic water hydro oceanscapes thinking? So I suggest that uh, Isabel uh, uh, takes the first question now uh, about landlocked waterways like rivers, lakes, and etc. And everybody can chip in uh, in the chat box about the second question and get back to it once we uh, move on to the after hours session. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks very much. So, you know, I'm a sort of literary scholar. So my take on that would be to think about uh, what a literary scholar, Margaret Cohen, who's written a very fabulous book called The Novel and the Sea. And she's got this idea of water chronotopes. So to think about, you know, uh, uh, white water, open water, I think estuary, lagoon, those sorts of things. Um, and so there's one way then to think about these, you know, in, in, in inland waterways is to think about what kinds of narrative forms, you know, what kinds of stories can be told about those 
you know, the estuary, the lagoon, uh, the deep pool, which in Southern Africa is really important because that's also often one uh, sort of an ancestral realm. Um, so I think there's, um, you know, really fascinating, you know, lots of um, uh, very, very, very interesting work in this area. Um, and then I'd be really interested to hear comments on um, this, uh, it, 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 people's views on the second questions, because when Sintry initially invited me, we, I was asking him what he was interested in, um, and he said he was very interested in a, in a project of how you think about, I think, forms of language and discourse in relation to water epistemologies. So I'd be very interested to hear what um, you linguist guys have to say about that. Does anyone wants to want to answer the, the my uh, initial thinking about this when when I thought it would be good to listen to you was that I I was trying to explore other ways of framing issues about language discourse and linguistics by drawing from uh, notions about wet epistemologies or liquid materiality. In other words, trying to say, how do conceptions of language change? If, for example, we ground our thinking about language in the in what you're calling a hydro-colonialism, for example. That was what um, I was interested in trying to see where that will take us. I think what will happen amongst other things is that your, our notions of language um, are likely to be disturbed quite substantially through issues about liquid materiality because if you say, water shapes how we imagine the world, then it will have to shape how we imagine language. That language at the moment, rightly or wrongly, is seen as, as consisting of objects or practices as standing outside water, independent of water. But if you then say water is important in our shaping, of uh, our in, in shaping our thinking, then language itself will have to change. The way we think or imagine language will have to change. That was my sort of uh, entry point into this particular discussion. Right. <clears throat> I don't know, Rafael, does that make sense to you? Yes, intriguing. Looking forward mm -hmm. to hearing more. Mm -hmm. Sangeeta, do you have? Uh... Any comments? Uh, do you uh, have you uh, considered the ways in which uh, our uh, sociolinguistic fields, uh, social semiotic fields, can uh, take up this challenge or include the water-based epistemologies to uh, broaden research on uh, linguistic landscapes or semiotic landscapes? Yeah. Well, not really. This uh, this thought emerged during the talk today. Mm -hmm. Uh, but at the same time, I think I agree with you, Simpri, perhaps from another point of departure. We constantly in the past 10, 15 years have heard about the shift towards fluidity, mm -hmm. so understanding going beyond uh, the structures of named languages, mm -hmm. so the fluidity. And, and the metaphor of water then allows you to understand this liquid materiality. Yes, yes. Um, but I, I am a bit more diffuse. I haven't given this thought, but maybe there is another way of thinking. But then mm. we, you could then go on to what about air, something that you yes. are part of. Um, so, so language is something being all around us and we can't see it, but we have these very rigid fixed ideas. So no, I'm just, this is just that. Yes. If you then think of, let's say, water is everywhere, air is everywhere, then the issue that arises is that you then have to partially abandon 
the idea of languages as potentially commodifiable, right? Because that that is what you'll be moving away from because it's everywhere now. So <clears throat> colonial languages, non-colonial languages, that becomes a bit difficult to sustain if um, air is the metaphor that you are using to talk about language. And my suspicion is that what linguistics has done, unfortunately, is to foreclose the debates about what language could look like by relying heavily on Western theorization. For example, what does language look like from the perspective of a spirit, of an African spirit meeting? is an issue that is potentially more relevant to me than what does language look like from, from Fednet Sosuo's perspective. In other words, the, what the literary scholars have done is to say, we, we can look at a number of different things. So we could ask seriously, what do indigenous spirit mediums in, uh, in the Northern Cape view and think about language? to them, what does language look like? And that I think is a valid question to pose. Mm. Mm. Anyway. <clears throat> or drawing on uh, Eduardo Gomes, uh, how forests think uh, we could uh, build yes. on it and uh, perhaps yes. consider uh, yes. how rivers speak, for example. To each other, yeah, yeah, mm. yes. And, and it's likely that they speak to each other, but perhaps not in exactly the same way that you and me speak. Right. Mm. Mm. Michael Scott, I saw you nodding your head. I didn't know the in agreement or total disagreement. <laughs> uh, you're muted still, Michael. There we go. Sorry. Yeah, I was in total agreement. That was recognition uh, <laughs> and appreciation. That's all. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The, the, the question I wanted to ask um, Isabel, but now I can perhaps ask everybody, is that water is not only, let's say, oceans, rivers. In each of our households, at times we have got bottled water, piped water, and all that. Now, my question to myself as a linguist is, what, what is the impact of the idea of bottled water water coming from a tap, boreholes, and all that, on how I think or experience language, right? Are you going to buy bottled water every time now? Now, my question is, um, since it's, it's me who is involved in, in buying this bottled water, and I'm also a linguist, so the question is, if I were to transpose my experiences of buying bottled water, to how I experience language, what would language then begin to feel and look like? <laughs> Using my everyday encounters of language through tapped water, bottled water, bore walls, and that. Yeah. <laughs> At the moment, I'm not sure what that, how that would look like. We'll see what's your view. <clears throat> Can I just carry that? Oh, yeah, jump in, jump in, yeah. You are muted. Sorry, I, I just wanted to say, I've never thought about the idea of bottled language. <laughs> <laughs> what, what language is like? Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's possible that standardized language is in, is an example of a bottled language because I mean you have to have the rules and all things like that. Yeah. Mm. Right. Because now since we're in the after party, I mean yes. this is really <laughs> this is really interesting because you have all these uh, flavored waters. Yes. And uh, the, there is an age uh, generation difference mm -hmm. where uh, just 10 years ago you would find people in my generation taking a, a, a bottle with tap water in it and 
my children's generation would definitely not do that because it was an identity issue. Okay. Uh, so, so there were these, um, you would have ananas that is a pineapple uh, mm. uh, or a strawberry uh, water and you can't see it, but the taste is there. So, mm. so I'm, I'm wondering whether your metaphor is also about bottled language. Mm. Mm. Uh, there is this hierarchy of um, how we understand languages. Mm. But, but another thought that struck me as you, as you were discussing was this uh, um, current interest in the circulation of discourses on languages, which also then brings uh, the water metaphor very, it, it makes it very interesting. It is not circulation in some abstract manner. Mm -hmm. Water everywhere circulates. It circulates from rivers and land surfaces and then comes back uh, to the same uh, geographies or territories. And it also circulates globally through, through the intermixing of uh, water very um, um, tangibly. So, so the circulation metaphor also gets some kind of, uh, of uh, nurturance through this metaphor. Mm, 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 mm. Uh, Adrian, how does this come across from the De Democratic Republic of the Congo? <laughs> oh, Professor, <laughs> well, I don't have any question. I, I wish I could ask a question now on the Congo River. Okay, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> just uh, whether, um, just, uh, uh, and again, the use of water mm -hmm. in um, various spiritual activities in the Congo, mm -hmm. uh, just as far back as the 1921, mm -hmm. with that prophet called Simon Kimbangu, whose church has uh, just is one of the largest African independent churches, mm -hmm. and uh, and Samuel Kimbangu, as you know, spent thirty years in prison, mm -hmm. just uh, from nineteen twenty one to nineteen fifty one, mm -hmm. and water is very very important in that church symbolically, just mm -hmm. for healing and so on and so forth. I don't know whether just uh, Professor has uh, reflected on uh, that part of the world and the use of the water. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so it's like... But can I just get very briefly, I did, in many lives ago, I did some work on Simon Kimbangu, um, and I'd forgotten that whole water <laughs> aspect of his practice. And I think there was also this idea that maybe, I'm trying to think, um, if, whether it was this belief that he had particular, I think a book that never got wet, um, you know, it would be immersed in water, but it never actually, you know, be, be, because of its power, it could sort of withstand um, being penetrated by water. Um, I have to say this. Yes, yeah, um, <laughs> Thank you for a very intriguing talk. Mm -hmm. um, growing up in Ghana, I was very used to hearing about water that had life, especially like big water bodies. So Dr. McConey's question about what does it look like, you know, when we think about language and bottled water, uh -huh. was definitely thinking about, you know, I don't hear about, like I, I heard about um, water bodies having life, they speak, yes. like when you dam a river, uh -huh. you know, with no matter what, the water will find a way around it, it'll break down the dam, it's trying to say something. But, um, but never bottled water at home. Like, you don't hear, I don't hear that life that water is attributed when it's packaged when it's it's brought home when it's domesticated it's almost as if it's just in the wide open untamed water has life um so anyway and i've never heard it being talked about in an academic setting like this so this is um <laughs> bridging you know the academy and 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 indigenous thoughts so thank you for setting my yeah, I'm getting my brain moving. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Anissa, jump in. You're muted, Anissa. 
Thank you very much. This is extreme. It's taken my thoughts into a fluidity. <laughs> and uh, I've, I've come to this, you know, I'm wondering, talking about language, water, I mean, life began in water and water's always been a very integral part of human thinking and never absent from language. But I was wondering, do people who live close to water, mm -hmm. do those languages have a different relationship with water? Are they richer in water metaphors and things than people who are inland in the way? Because, I mean, I see the world as really, we are islands and the dominant thing is water. We're all surrounded by water, and some of us are far away from water. I mean, I'm never far away from water because all rivers and lakes, so every metaphor, everything in our lives has to do with lochs and rivers. But can you throw some light on this, that languages that are closer to water, mm -hmm. are they richer? Because then myths, of course, you know, from Aphrodite rising from water to all the gods and goddesses that live in water, mythologically it's all very rich the language of water but i mean it, the fluidity in language has always been there and there is something i mean you know we we so any light on that anybody uh can I come in simply? I, yeah, yeah, uh, jump in, Ashraf. Jump. Uh, simply, I just need to ask. Uh, uh, it might be related to Anissa's uh, point. Mm -hmm. uh, the notion of entanglement. Yes. Yes. And, and liquid materiality. Can, can you can you comment on this? Because I, I know that you have something to say about the notion of entanglement in relation to language. Do you have anything to say about in relation to liquid materiality or water? Epistemology. Okay. Hmm. I, I need to be careful here because the subject is here. Um, liquid material, in my mind, what I was trying to do when I was talking about liquid materiality was to bring together uh, the land and water based epistemologies to try and avoid creating some form of dichotomous relationship by bringing them together. So in a sense, I think what you are, what I was trying to do without saying so, was to talk about how the land and the ocean are entangled. The, the notion of entanglement uh, was, uh, I got it from Sarah Nettles book, I think on Johannesburg, yeah, Johannesburg is a city, the cultural entanglement, how the interweaving of different cultures. So what I was working on in my mind on liquid materiality was how land and water are all interwoven, right? That they, they, are top, they partially are mixed because even, even water, for example, yeah, I, if my sense of science is correct, there is uh, at the very bottom of the of the ocean, there is some form of land, right? So um, you could say that water is built on on land. So the two, even though you can conceptually separate them, are entangled. It are entangled. They they need each other in an attempt to make a coherent conceptual uh, framework. I don't know whether it makes sense. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, it makes, yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Cecil. I'll just jump in with a jump comment in. to Anissa's uh, intriguing question. I think that there is, but I mean, uh, this is just anecdotal. So if you think of uh, Bengali, both spoken in Bangladesh and um, in West Bengal, uh, you have this phrase called Jal Tori. <coughs> so with the vegetarianism that is there, uh, so Tori would um, kind of map onto things that grow on land, which is vegetables and fruits. But Jal is water. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so fish and water, um, what one would from a very um, non-Bengali uh, perspective would consider to be animal is considered tori, vegetable. Uh, and, and in Swedish, you have very similar kind of ways in which you, you would have to actually leave a mainstream understanding and then see through how uh, water in its various um, in, in its various forms. Uh, I, I saw that uh, Christine had put up this uh, comment, which is what got me going about flying rivers. So you have similar ways of understanding water different kinds of ice, snow. Uh, so, so I don't know whether that is richness, but there is definitely a variation that you wouldn't find in other places where water in its, only in its liquid form exists. But this is anecdotal, so, but interesting. I mean, one of the strengths of water is that it can become solid, liquid, it can turn to steam. And it influences, I mean, our language is influenced by the states of water. Okay, okay, I see, I see. I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Mm -hmm. and, and then there's also a comment from Sanel. Do you want to comment on the mangrove? Uh, yes, actually, um, that that made the comment. So I just jumped in um, um, on just uh, noting the paper that I read by Escobar uh, when he speaks about relational ontologies. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, um, so I thought that would be quite an interesting way of thinking as well about the relationship we have with, with water um, and trying to not dichotomize um, land and, and water. Um, yeah, so, so, so that, 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 that would be my contribution. Also thinking of the fact that we all, because we consist of water as humans, 60% mm -hmm. uh, of our body consists of water. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that, that, that leads me to, I want to ask Isabel a question. When I was reading your introduction, you talk about the distinction between what you call a radical object oriented ontological approach as compared with a network oriented understanding. Um, a radical object oriented ontology as compared with a network oriented understanding. What are the differences there? Okay, <laughs> have a confession. I put, <laughs> uh, I put that in because one of the reviewers insisted that it go in. So. <laughs> 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 so I sort of tried my best to understand all of this object-oriented ontology stuff, but it seems to me, you know, that the mm -hmm. radical stuff is that we cannot know objects. Okay. They are, they are, you know, it's the sort of, they are withdrawn from us. Yeah. And, you know, we can either, and what we normally do with them is we can try and understand them by their parts, uh -huh. or we can thrust them into our context. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's, it's the sense of like that objects are really, we know nothing about them, we cannot understand them. And then the, the, the networked one seems to be a sort of softer version of that, that objects have this separate sort of ontological independence, uh, existence that we can never really penetrate, but that they are parts of networks that interact with other objects, they interact with humans, um, and so that there is some possibility of understanding them as part of networks. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I, I found this stuff really, really hard. You know, I, I really I tried my best to get on top of it, but that's, that's 
that's the sort of best understanding of it that I can give you. It was, um, when I was reading the introduction, it just stood out. It didn't feel like it was part, it was embedded in the text. It felt like you were writing something and all of a sudden there were these uh, couple of lines and then you moved on to write whatever you wanted to say. And that's why I thought no, I should come and ask you what exactly you meant by this, yeah. Okay. That's, that's the, the, the history of that passage. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Mike, yes, you wanted to talk. You, you wrote something in the chat box. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I'm just. Uh, I've been using a lot of social media trying to learn Swahili. Yes. And it has occurred to me that it's really hard to keep up and catch <laughs> what's being what's being said or sung or rapped. Uh -huh. uh, it, it is like uh, a river flowing that you just can't you can't catch at all. <laughs> That's all my my two bits on um, <laughs> on fluidity and language. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Can I just come in and suggest a project for the linguists? Yes, um, yes, yeah. The, the, the one I really, the, the article I found really useful, let me just. <laughs> uh, 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 this fabulous media studies scholar, Melody Jew, um, and she's got this article submerging Kittler, and she's make the, the point of it is to make us aware how how much of our technologies of inscription are so dry, you know. So our whole understanding, for example, of an archive, is based on these very dry forms of inscription. So she then tries to think some of this underwater and says. Like, in fact, and the, you know, a coral, for example, is a form of archive, but it's, you know, it stores information in completely different sorts of ways. Um, and also partly what she's trying to do is then to radically resituate Kittler's idea. So I think the linguists have to go and do a project called Submerging Sisur. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so Submerging so, so in the in the Kariba Dam would be what I want to contribute to. <laughs> and Ashraf, you would want to submerge so, so in the Nile River. <laughs> yes, I think that would be interesting thing to do. Yes. Bosi, you have been very quiet. Any comments that you want to oh, 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 oh Sang, no. Sangita, you wanted to jump in. Oh Mike, just jump in. I mean this. Mm. I had a request to Isabel, if you could just put the name uh, of the scholar you mentioned right now in the chat, please. If you just scroll up, I've put it there already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Vishna, what do you want to say about water, epistemology, hydrocolonialism from Serbia? What would it look like? Hello. Oh, let's yeah. go. Hi. Mm -hmm. um, from Serbia. Um, <laughs> that's a very interesting question. I don't know. I have to think more about that. I think. <laughs> um, Serbia is on two rivers. Uh -huh. um, and so, I mean, fishing is, is, is big in Serbia. And I, it's just, but I just don't, I can't conceptually think right now what that would mean. But that's mm -hmm. a, it's definitely a question I'll think about. Yeah. Yes. So it would be like uh, fishing typologies and language typologies in the Serbia. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. Edwin Dati, what's your view? You've been very quiet. How does this feel like from Ghana? So, um, it's similar to what Phoebe was saying, that um, how we related to water, especially 
um, there are certain notions that some of the rivers and some of the waters have life and that they belong to certain gods mm -hmm. um, in, back in Ghana. And so, for instance, on let's say Tuesday, on Wednesday, we don't go fishing yes. in those rivers. And, mm. and, and so those things kind of helps us objectify the rivers and, and our knowledge of the rivers is that they belong to a certain person. And then the way we relate to it has to be constrained. Uh -huh. And also the language that we use towards when we are describing those rivers mm -hmm. and, and how we communicate to those rivers it's like it's kind of objective, right? Mm -hmm. Both in in communication senses, both in religious senses, and all those things. And so, this this conversation is really intriguing because it's I'm trying to understand why we were doing the things we were doing, mm -hmm. and trying to reflect on the relationship we have with the rivers and how we even use it. So, for another example, is that. Um, when you go to the river, you don't have to step into the river. You just fetch it. And the the way the sanctity of the rivers were preserved and all that. And, and I'm trying to think of how those practices were done and how the language that was used in those practices mm -hmm. also being done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This also leads me to think about so rivers and the sacredness. There's, you know, how liquid places are sometimes where two rivers meet. The confluence of a river is considered by many cultures to be energizing. Mm -hmm. And then there are rivers in the world like uh, the Ganga, etc., which are sacred. And there's a lot of language of sacredness around those <coughs> those waters. Mm. But for me, the, there are two aspects that are beginning to emerge now. One is a philosophical one where we are trying to work out how we would conceptualize language using um, some of the scholarship uh, that Isabel Salanatal and have, have, um, have produced on water epistemologies. The second one is the one which goes like this. Uh, is it possible to communicate with the rivers? Mm -hmm. If that is possible, what is the nature of the communication that one, um, that occurs when humans are communicating with, uh, with rivers or with oceans or with water? Why that is interesting to me is that the first assumption made in linguistics is that communication or human communication only takes place between humans, etc. But if you shift and you say you can have water as your interlocutor, then you need a completely different uh, apparatus of understanding the nature of that communication, right? Because all the issues about spirit mediums and that we're talking about presuppose that some form of communication uh, does take place between humans and um, spirit mediums who are in water. But the analytical apparatus we have in linguistics cannot take us very far. You need to go into folklore, literature, et cetera, in order to be able to see how you can provide a how you can provide a paradigmatic description of the nature of that communication between humans and water. Because I think linguistics has done itself a disservice by restricting the range of genres that it analyzes to be between humans and humans, but not include this other broader range. So if we think about multiple species in the world, we therefore need to have a multi-species communication in linguistics, humans and forests, humans and water, et cetera. Anyway, I'm just thinking aloud. Rafael, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Uh, and I saw that. Uh, just being polite. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, uh, it, it does uh, because it's uh, in a way uh, linking uh, the conversation today to yeah. other shifts that we've uh, been yeah. talking about in previous uh, sessions. Uh, yeah. I saw the comment that Chanel wrote uh, about the implications of giving river rights, granting yes. it a yes. legal yes. personhood. And I yeah. think uh, it was a similar case that uh, Elizabeth Covinelli dealt with uh, yeah. in the context of uh, Australia, uh, where a certain uh, geographical area uh, or the political uh, discussions that mm -hmm. emerged from uh, the way in which uh, Aborig Aboriginal people wanted to uh, grant uh, this specific area. I'm not sure if it was uh, exactly a legal per personhood, but at least some sort of... Uh, uh, protection uh, and uh, that was a uh, part of her book um, uh, called uh, Geontologist mm. uh, which has uh, pretty much this uh, uh, aspect or uh, this uh, uh, intention of shifting uh, mm. where uh, ontologists or uh, thoughts are generated and knowledge is produced mm. uh, in the same way that uh, I think we're trying to uh, yeah. Uh, experiment here, uh, thinking of how uh, centering our understandings of communication around uh, the notion of uh, water as agentive or having a, uh -huh. a sort of ontological status that's usually uh, dismissed in how we think about uh, meaning making and communication. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I, I think it does make sense in the same way that uh, uh, I have a hard time <laughs> uh, yeah, getting my head around. And according to analytical psychology, like uh, in Jung's work, mm. I mean, our thoughts are influenced by our subconscious as well. And our subconscious is very influenced by our myths. And we sometimes have to discover our myths. And, um, you know, the culture, the surroundings, the myths that we're carrying, they all influence our thought and our thought influences our language. Okay, let me ask Vicky, how, how, how do these arguments come across in Kenya? Vicky, she, she, can't, she, she can't hear me. Kim. From your experience across the world, how do these arguments come across? Um, it, it makes me think a lot about Cape Verde, where yes. I live. Um, they're islands off the coast of Senegal, and mm. they're named for being a green cape, but um, that's entirely dependent on the rain, mm -hmm. uh, if the rain comes. and. Uh, a lot of people rely on subsist subsistence agriculture there as well. Mm -hmm. So the rain is really important. There's like a, a limited amount of fresh water. Mm -hmm. um, so the relationship to water, to rain is really kind of uh, uh, urgent and on like a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. Is there water? Is there not? Do we have to like go travel to the freshwater spring and transport water back home for all of our various uh, activities and so it's uh, it's it's a much more kind of day-to-day -day operation and mm -hmm. um, there's different festivals and celebrations for when the rain actually does come and it it really does transform the whole kind of landscape from like brown and red to like completely covered in uh, green kind of um, uh, like the uh, vegetation becomes, it, it changes completely the landscape. So um, I was thinking about it in that regard because they're islands and you can pretty much see the ocean from mm -hmm. wherever you are because they're mm -hmm. so small, mm -hmm. but that water is not potable. That's not, um, it doesn't have the same relationship as the fresh water does. So. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I started thinking about as we were talking. Kim, thank you for bringing the notion of color because mm -hmm. to the artist, water is very important and its relationship with light. Mm -hmm. It gives names to different hues, 
depending on the interaction of light with water. And many artists, you know, they completely changed their palette by arriving, you know, for example, people like Paul Clay arriving from the continent of Europe to North Africa and seeing the blue <laughs> that they had never seen before. And it influenced their whole palette. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, what about Irene Burnotti? Irene, what's your tip? Irene is hiding me. Oh, Cliff, Cliff, since you are near where Isabel is in Jobe, what's your view about all this? Mm. Okay, I was just wondering what Isabel would think about the issue of uh, environmental justice and how uh, the Eastern Cape communities are now reclaiming that space in terms of the land and the water, as opposed to the earlier, earlier colonialization through through the white settlers, and now and what is going on currently. I just wanted to hear comment on that. Thanks. You know, they, I don't know if you saw the. the I so saw, I didn't look at the whole judgment, but the, the, um, just the sort of background is that there was, Shell wanted to do seismic surveys off the part of the South African coast. And so community environmental groups and various other groups got together and brought a, a sort of interdict to try and stop this from happening, which, and they were successful. And in the judgment, I was completely fascinated to see this. They said one of the reasons that these community groups had brought was that the seismic surveys would disturb the ancestors. Mm. And this yeah. was regarded as, uh, you know, a, 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 as a, a, one of the reasons to stop this. So I was just completely fascinated to see that, you know, cited in a judgment, um, you know, and which also, you know, it's, um, you know, you would never have seen that. 20 or 30 or 40 years mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what was the final judgment? Did they win or what was the final judgment? Um, I think as far as I, I'm not quite on top of the details, I think there, there were two, mm -hmm. two seismic surveys, one on the East Coast and one on the West Coast. I think mm -hmm. the West Coast won the the people doing the seismic survey have now withdrawn. Okay. Um, I think the, the Eastern Cape one is, uh, if I remember correctly, there's a further court case still to be held. Oh, to be had. Okay. But it's all sort of on hold for the moment. Okay, good. Right. This has been fascinating and Rafael, do you want to conclude? And then Kim can make an announcement about our next session. This is Isabel, thanks a lot for spending your time with us. We have enjoyed it. We shall be reading more of your work and trying to extrapolate what it means for, for our lives as linguists. <laughs> Really, thank you so much. It's been, it's been, it's been, it's been really a great, a great yeah. pleasure. And let, let, me, let me know if bottled water goes further. Yes, we, we will. We will let you know. We'll let you know. Mm. Right. No, thank you. And thanks, everyone, for the very interesting questions and comments and contributing to this uh, enriching afternoon, uh, morning, or evening. <laughs> maybe. Mm.